Welcome everybody, this is Larry Lawton. I got a great video for you guys today. This is the Marcel Osanu video, who's a baseball player who got caught with a DUI. And I'm gonna explain this whole case. I brought two professionals in. I brought a ENT with 40 years experience and I brought a prosecutor and a sports attorney as well to uh, make sure we get this one right. You know, because I, I don't like when police abuse, abuse power in any way. And I'm not so sure it's just abuse. I just want to make sure everybody understands what we are doing. Before I get started, everybody, check me out. YouTube member programs, Patreon. Check us out on Discord. Check out Merch Out, Gangster Redemption, doing great. We got the cigar. The cigar, the Crooked Diamond, man. Check our website out at uh, crookeddiamondcigar.com. That's crookeddiamondcigar.com. And don't forget about our free giveaway. I'm giving away a free cruise for two, flying in from anywhere in the United States. And that is happening on November 18th. All you got to do is sign up on both of my YouTube channels, subscribe if you probably are already, and also sign up for our newsletter and you will be involved in this thing. Now, let me get and premise this whole entire video. This video is about a body cam footage that I saw of Marcel Osanu, who is a left fielder for the Atlanta Braves, all-star, very polite young man. I was very nice to see this. You're going to see this in the video well. I brought two people in because when I saw this video, I could not believe that this man was arrested for a DUI. And I want to preface this. You Atlanta Braves fans, you should be checking yourself because I'll tell you what, I am so disappointed in you people booing somebody for something you have no idea. And when the prosecutor comes on, we're going to talk about that as well. So you guys got to check yourself. You got to know the facts. Don't judge people before the facts come out. Just because you're arrested does not mean you're guilty. That's number one. Okay, my first guest is Dr. Frank Filiberto. Dr. Filiberto has 40 years as an ENT surgeon. He's also board uh, certified in plastics. And also he is one of the leading pot doctors in the United States. In fact, we're going to get into his whole entire resume on impairment because uh, they all watch this video again, and we're going to watch it again right here in the studio. So first of all, Doc Filiberto, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Mr. Lund. Well, we're going to go over a video, and I'd like to get your professional opinion. Uh, you have 40 years as an ENT surgeon? What certified? Otolaryngologist, which is ENT. As a ENT surgeon, did you deal with equilibrium, sight, eyes, ears? Uh, what does an ENT actually do? Well, we, we're the people you go to if, you, uh, if you're dizzy or disoriented or have, having problems with uh, uh, equilibrium and so forth. So it's the, it's the ENT slash otolaryngologist that takes care of these problems. I'm going to consider you an expert on the video we're going to do because we're going to be talking about equilibrium. We're going to be talking about the eyes. Yes, sir. And we're going to talk about certain tests that are given by police officers. Yes, sir. And uh, obviously, as a person who's been in ENT for 40 years, have you done brain surgery? Yes. Uh, ear surgery? Yes. Eye surgery? Yes. Wow. I think, uh, you know, if I was a juror and if I was a judge, I'd qualify you as a expert witness. And I think you are, obviously. Uh, we're going to get into this case, and I want to preface you by giving you the story to begin with. And I also have in the studio everybody who's watching this right now and is coming on next, so don't miss this. I have a, prosecutor, a former prosecutor who is an amazing attorney and also a sports management attorney and, and handles athletes as well. So she's going to be a really good addition on the law. Obviously, the doctor is going to give us the, uh, the, his professional knowledge on the test that was given in this case. So I think this is going to be very interesting. Uh, first of all, Doc, let's open up the video, and I'm going to open it up when he gets stopped, okay? I want you to watch this. Can you see the tip of this pen? Yeah. The blue light, right? Yeah. All I want you to do is follow this with your eyes, okay? Leave your head still. All right. You understand? Yeah. All right. Watch the blue light. Look yeah, it. I saw it. You can see it? Yeah, I saw it. All right. Leave your head still. Yeah, I saw it. Watch the light, man. I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. Listen, look at the light. Don't look at it. Oh, the... I have to look at the light? Yes, okay. sir. Yeah. Okay. Do you see the blue light? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Don't move your head. Just follow it with your eyes. Okay. Another moment. It's okay. Okay, Doc. We are watching right now the eye test that this officer gives. He stops this young man saying he was speeding. Uh, the, the man did admit that he had a couple beers. 
I don't understand how long that meant, but we'll ask the attorney all about that as well. In your case, as a professional, I want you to watch this again one more time, and I want you to tell me, is this test done correctly, and what does it show? The test is to check for nystagmus, which is a horizontal or a vertical uh, tremor you see in the eyes with somebody that uh, has a brain injury or is intoxicated or is having some type of uh, thing going on with their brain. It could be neurological. It could be anything. But it's a, it's, it's, you look at the eyes uh, in various gaze positions, and you will see a tremor in the eyes. It's a, sort of a, uh, it's a fast and a slow movement. Fast one way, comes back slow. Fast the other way, comes back slow. It's called nystagmus. Right? And the way you determine the nystagmus is you have that individual, which you could see in the video, uh, where the officer is having him look at his eyes in lateral gaze movements to the right, to the left. And at the same time, he's, sliding, he, he's, he's using a flashlight to look at whether or not his eyes are bouncing up and down or b- bouncing sideways. So they're not looking at dilation of any sort in no, an sir. eye. No, okay. Sir. So that that's something that I didn't know. I thought they did look at dilation. So you're watching this test. Now, you saw the video from the beginning. Yes. Obviously, I think there's a little bit of a language barrier. And it seems like he didn't understand the test. Did you see that? Well, it was obvious from the beginning, uh, if, if you look at the test, that when the, uh, when the officer uh, asked him to follow the flashlight, he just kept staring straight. He kept saying, I see the light. I see the light. So from the onset, he did not understand the test. Well, obviously, I didn't hear the officer also say, uh, hey, listen, follow this light. He did eventually say that, so he was actually doing. What struck me uh, clearly is he didn't move. He didn't waver. He didn't uh, go left to right. He's standing with his feet together. Uh, Obviously, that is showing that he's following. Is he going too far with that light? Well, when you do when you do a gaze nystagmus or gaze where you're looking for the um, the actual movement of the eye with, with what's called a fast and a slow phase, uh, where it, it will beat fast one way and come back to the middle, and then beat again back to the same area and come back to the middle. When you do that, naturally you take the flashlight and you examine them and you move the light to the left, let's say. Then you move the light to the right. Where the mistake occurred in this particular situation in evaluating the the test that was being administered, the the officer moved him to an extreme gaze position. Uh, in other words, you're supposed to really move uh, to check for nystagmus three quarters of the away, where you don't move all the way into what's known as the lateral rectus muscle. There's a muscle you have on both sides of your eyes where if you move it all the way over, eventually that muscle is going to go into spasm and you're going to precipitate gaze, all right? So A twitch. A twitch. So if you, if you notice, he kept doing it to where he's going to exhaust those muscles and he was going to an extreme on both sides. It seemed to me as a layman, again, that's why I brought a professional like yourself and, and the prosecutor coming in and former prosecutor and the uh, sports attorney, is... He seemed like he did it so long. It wasn't once or twice. Would once or twice be sufficient to see if there was a, a twitch in the eye? If he was, if 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 that individual was uh, compromised, his central nervous system was compromised, such as his brain from intoxication, uh, you you get it right away on one on one one basically movement. Uh, uh, he did it for an extremely long time, which then you're talking about fatigue now. Now you're talking about a situation where he's going all the way to one side, all the way to the other side, all the way to one side. So obviously he didn't see anything or the intention was to precipitate the nystagmus. It seems like he kept looking for something to go the next time. If, if I was a police officer and I did that test and he, it happened right away, I would stop. Okay, I got that. Next one, next one, next one. There's three things I was talking to you before the show that actually, uh, I guess would show somebody's impaired. You you mentioned three things. It's the brain, the are, eye, and the ear. Can you explain? There are three things that, that control your stability or your equilibrium. And it would be your eyes, right? It would be your brain, and it would be your ears. Uh, your ears have 
levels in them called semicircular canals, the little levels that are in your ear. So on head movement, all right, you get you get this liquid in the ear that will balance you out as you move, all right? Your eyes also send signals to your brain that there is uh, there's some type of head there's a head movement going on where the brain will compensate for that. A perfect example of of the way you solve that problem when somebody is dizzy, for instance, if somebody is extremely dizzy, what you ask them to do is you ask them to stare at a dot on the wall. If they stare on a dot on the wall, their eyes are able to overcome the dizziness, right? So the eyes play a very important part in the dizzy. The ears do, and then you have the brain, right? And that's that's what we're testing for, basically, when you when you have somebody that has a brain impairment or a neurological condition, for instance, people that have brain tumors, their eyes are jumping all over the place. A uh, question on it. So are you? there's three things you look for. Uh, right. Again, the eyes, the ears, and the brain. Yes. If a person is impaired in any way, whether it's with drugs or alcohol, can they function at all with a one or two of, the, uh, with two of those not working? You could function with one of them not working. You can't function when two of the three is not working. So if a person is impaired, where does the impairment go to? Does it go to the brain? Does it go to the eyes? Does it go to the ear? How does it work? It goes to the brain usually if, there, if it's an intoxication situation. It will go to the brain. If, if your brain is, is, uh, is compromised, right, then you will see in your eye movement, that's where they check the nystagmus, you will see because the, the eyes are trying to compensate for the brain problem, right? So that's where the nystagmus comes in, the twitching of the eyes, because the eyes want to bring you back to normal. So you'll get that twitch to one side, and it comes back to normal, because the eye is trying to bring you back to an equilibrium state. That's, what, that's what's happening. Okay, we're going to move on to the second test. Now, this test, again, I watched this video probably 20 times. First of all, I couldn't understand the instructions per se. And then they had this man go on a line, a straight line, and... Uh, go straight down the line, back and forth, and they ask them to look down. Does that mean anything in this case? It means a lot in this particular case. As I explained to you, with the uh, the eyes uh, will give you a spatial orientation. All right, uh, the eyes are the eyes are very important for maintaining your balance. And what he did was right. He the the, the individual they was doing the test on lost his spatial orientation by having just stare on the ground. Right rather than look at look at the time and space that he was in. So looking down, right, would compromise that that ability for his eyes to overcome any brain problem he may have. Now, th- this man had one foot in front of another. Yes. So that, that alone, I tried that. I mean, mm-hmm. you listen, guys, everybody knows I get a little fucked up now and then myself. But I, I saw that, and, and I couldn't do it. I little, and I'm straight as an arrow. And I couldn't do it. Is it normal for most people not to be able to do that? Well, again, it depends on the age, naturally. I mean, at my age, I probably would not be able to do it. Call me an old fuck doc? Yeah. <laughs> not you, but uh, I'm a lot older than you are. Uh, I, think, I think the situation is is that you know we, we are dealing with an athlete that's finely tuned here. Uh, I think the important issue here is that he didn't fall off the line even when they compromised his eyes, right? Now, you took... You basically... Put, took two out of the three mechanisms, supposedly, if he was impaired. If he, if he really was impaired, now you have his brain impaired, and now you take away his eyes as far as his spatial orientation by having him staring at the ground, right? So he, if he was impaired, would if he not be able to do that? He would not have been able to do it. He would not be, would able, not so be that, able to do that. That's, that's test number two. Let's look at this test, Doc. I want you to look at this for a minute. You can lift either foot, okay, of your choice, right or left. I'm going to lift up my left foot. You're going to hold it approximately six inches from the ground. Look down at your raised foot. Hands by your side, and you're going to count out loud. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. All right, and keep counting okay. until I tell you to stop. Okay. Hold on, hold on. And do you understand? Yeah. All right, I'll let you know when to start, okay? Okay. No problem. You can begin. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007. Okay, Doc, you just saw a man count to 20, 
with his foot six inches off the ground, his hands by his side, feet together, and literally not budge. And again, they had him look down. Yeah. And that's called proprioceptor response. Basically, your brain and spinal cord are connected. Your spinal cord is your brain, basically. right? And they have him one foot up, right? They're... Uh, if his brain was compromised, all right, his whole, his whole balance from his spinal cord to his brain, he would have not been able to do that. He would have not been able to do that. And not to even do it, he didn't even twitch for 20 seconds, as you can see. There wasn't even a movement. So uh, it didn't show any impairment to me. Okay, Doc, we, we went through the medical parts of this test that I think is very important for you, for you to give the audience a really medical opinion on. Obviously, as an expert ENT surgeon for 40 years, you've seen impaired people. You're also a, uh, I guess, the certified, you are the leading doctor in the state of Florida for marijuana. Correct. And you went to schools, and, and uh, or you were one of the only doctors that went to a specific marijuana school, too? Uh, I did a whole semester, 40 credit hours in California on marijuana. Wow. Uh, for marijuana. And, and that's besides your ENT training of 40 years, besides your plastics. Train, besides my plastic training, yes, sir. So, obviously, you know, uh, as a person who deals with the eyes, the ears, did, did anything strike you, anything on this thing, that that man was impaired at all? No, nothing at all. So you'd state your professional reputation that that man was not impaired? Yes, sir. Wow, uh, it's hard to fight that. Uh, why do you think, and I'm going to ask for an opinion now, and I know it's just your opinion. We came, you came here for your uh, expertise, obviously. Thank you for that. We're going to bring the attorney on to ask some legal questions, but with your case, where do you think the mistake was made in this case? I think there was a, uh, I, I don't want to say uh, a certain prejudice as far as him uh, drinking, but I think there was a language barrier, and I think the language barrier was was misinterpreted uh, as as him. You know, when someone doesn't understand questions, they automatically think, "Well, he doesn't understand the questions because uh, he's drunk." Right? There was an obvious language barrier from the beginning. Uh, the individual was totally uh, alert and oriented to his time and space. If you saw when he got out of the car, he was polite. He raised his hands, just as people are taught to do, to be polite to pl policemen and, and, and follow their rules. You know, people that, are, people that are drunk don't follow rules. You know, it, it, that is true. Not that I haven't been drunk once or twice in my life. But, you know, Doc, what, what impressed me about this young man was, one, you said it, he was polite. He followed the rules. He didn't waver. I look at myself as a juror, and that's how I look at things, pretty much common sense-wise, and there's not a, a, a chance in heck. And I'm going to talk to an attorney about it. I'm sure she's going to have her opinions. Uh, but she's a sports attorney, too, so she deals with athletes, so she's going to understand that, too. I didn't see anything where this man was impaired personally. Now, I've been around a lot of people who have been impaired on drugs, on alcohol, and whatever. Uh, there was a part in the video, and I'll go with the attorney as well, just for your opinion. He did say he had a couple of drinks, or two or three. That's kind of his admission. I even think that was a, a, uh, a communication barrier. So after he does the three tests in Europe, professional opinion he totally passed them 100 percent. why do you think that they went to the next step of a dui uh, a breathalyzer test I'm well i i i think that the system has been created all right where we are all taught by our attorneys right never to blow never to blow right i think the only thing i only the only thing this policeman had going for him is knowing that he was not going to blow and that gave him the opportunity to lock him up. Uh, you know, in my you, opinion, that's only and, my opinion. And I, I understand that, Doc. You're allowed. This is the real. This is my show. This is Larry Law and Jude Leaf, and opinions are allowed. But your professional opinion means more more to our audience than anything because you are a professional. You are. Listen, I qualified you in front well, of a jury. I, mean, I had forty years as an ENT surgeon who deals with equilibrium and balance and and looking at the, the eye test you opened my eyes with. Uh, I did not know that. What is your recommendation on tests to somebody who is stopped by the police? There's a, there's a perfect test that they can teach police, right? It's called the Romberg test, right? Remember from the original discussion, which you talked, we talked about, there are three things that, that get you to maintain your balance. Your eyes, 
your ears, and your brain, which is also your spinal cord, your brain, right? What happens is if you have one of the three that are out, you can still maintain your balance. If you have two of the three that are out, you're going to fall over. A, a perfect, so what Romberg does, right, we do this, for, I do this, now. every patient comes to my office. If they come in and they have headaches or uh, dizziness, what I do is I have them stand up and have them close their eyes. If they close their eyes, they lose the ability of their eyes to, to equilibrate what the brain is, and they'll fall over if they have a brain or an ear problem. You lose two out of three. Once you lose two out of three, you're in trouble. Right? So he, he, a person who loses two out of three could no way do what this man did. Could no, do, no way do what he did. And, and, they, and they basically took away his eyes when they had him look down when he was walking. So they've taken away one of the three. And, and he still functioned. Yeah. And, and Well, I saw that too as well, Doc. Uh, I just want to, again, emphasize thank you very much for coming on this show. We're going to bring an attorney on now. I'd like you to sit in on it and maybe bring you back for a question or two. But uh, you, in your professional opinion, I just want to emphasize this one more time. This man was not, in car, uh, not impaired in any way in your mind. The, the, the sorry thing about this is... He passed each test with flying colors. And then you threw a wrench at him with the breathalyzer test, knowing that nobody does a breathalyzer test. There are very few people who do. And if they do and they blow zero, he's still going to lock you up because it's, it's the policeman's judgment of impairment. It's well, too subjective. We're going to get into that with the attorney here right now. Uh, we're going to now bring the attorney on. Thank you, Doc. I really want to thank uh, you very much, Mr. Appreciate Lord. that. I appreciate uh, it for coming on. That's Dr. Frank Filiberto. Everybody. Now I'm going to bring on uh, Mrs. Moya, who is a attorney, former prosecutor, has uh, prosecuted, I guess, hundreds of DUI cases. Uh, she is an accomplished attorney, so now she's a sports attorney as well. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Larry. Ms. Moyer, let me just give a little bit of background. How many DUI cases, both in the misdemeanor division and the felony division, do you think you handled? Hundreds. Hundreds. From inception to all the way to a jury verdict. Okay, well, we're going to go over the same videos. You saw them already, but we're going to go over them again because I think this is a different opinions here. Also, I'd like to, uh, uh, you went to what school? University of Florida. Uh, go, go Gators. Go Gators. Okay. Uh, mine was University of Hard Knocks. So I was a pretty, go Hard Knocks. But no. <laughs> so I'm you only, went to college. Yeah, that's my college. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a common sense guy, uh, Ms. Moyer. Uh, obviously, we talked a little bit beforehand, but a lot of stuff you're going to highlight my audience on. First of all, you watched the test that the doctor just explained. I did. Did you see those tests many times? <gasps> Hundreds of times. Videos, I've examined so many DUI videos, I can't even count. Okay, and a as a prosecutor, when you look at those, do they mean something? Oh, they I'm mean everything. The video is everything. So you, you, you saw it. I'm going to get into it a little bit first here because there were a couple of things I looked at that kind of threw, threw a wrench at me. When uh, Marcel Ozano got out of the car, he put his hands up. He did. He did. You know, getting pulled over by an officer, no matter who you are, it's an intimidating experience. And I think that's very telling that he knew exactly what was going on uh, compared to somebody who's maybe impaired, wouldn't be so aware of his surroundings. He immediately gets out of the car yep. and he knows the situation. He, he put his hands up, actually. Yep. That's sad. I hate and to see that we, we, we come to the... Uh, Come to the point in the United States when a cop pulls you coming out with your hands up like you're guilty of something. Sure, you know, and it, but it, it really just it reflects him as a person too. You know, he's respectful. Uh, he understands what's going on, and um, I think it sheds some good good light on him. And well, as we I, further see, see, here's my my issue, and I'm going to go into this with the prosecutor as a prosecutor, and I know you're not a prosecutor anymore. You actually handle professional athletes. We, it, are professional athletes different than regular people? Do you handle them? I know you treat them. Like you would tell me like your family. Of course. You know, I, I think society views them as, as a, at a higher standard and potentially this officer who pulled him over that night, you know, but they are just people. I mean, you know, right. yes, they're professional athletes, but um, they're expected, they've got a lot of pressure. They're expected to be role models in our communities, and um, but they are uh, just people at the same time. I have a question now. We're going to keep going on the question. Now, you saw the tests. If you saw those tests as a prosecutor in a... You were a prosecutor in Pinellas County, Florida, yep. which is Tampa Bay area. Yep, St. Petersburg, Clearwater. 
Clearwater, Tampa. That's the west coast of Florida for everybody. Uh, pretty big area, obviously. Yes. Professional athletes all over the place oh, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you saw the tests and actually heard the doctor, actually, w- how much of an influence, one, would the doctor be on you? Two, how about the videos yourself as seeing hundreds of them? Yeah. So when you're sitting down as a prosecutor and an officer brings you the case, the DUI case, um, you're taking a look at the video and thinking, can I prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt? And that's the thing that has to be in your mind the entire time. Um, And watching that video, uh, my recommendation would have been to not file formal formal charges for DUI on that video. Um, But it's the totality of the circumstances, which we will get to. Well, we're going to get to that question. Uh, Obviously, when we were watching the, the tape, we watched it a few times already. And you saw him admit that he had two or three beers. Oh, you uh, had anything to drink tonight? Yeah, but well, right. I'm what, fine. What would you have? Yeah. What have you had to drink? Just beer, a couple of beers. Obviously, he's a big guy. I was kind of confused of why the cop wouldn't ask him when he took him, how long ago did he have a drink. Do an investigation. If you're going to do an investigation, do a complete investigation. Sure. Sure. I think that admission is really what precipitated the entire thing and made the officer go further. Unfortunately, you know, uh, Marcel was being honest, which I think a jury would appreciate and respect. Um, It's tough when somebody makes that type of an admission. The officer's already going to have it predisposed in his mind. I've got him for your DUI. Well, obviously, what, what you saw, what the doctor actually explained, and what I saw, I think everybody sees, this man's not impaired because you couldn't do that. Uh, And you agree with that? So what consequences could the officer or should he face in your department in, as a prosecutor, which people don't know are above the police, uh, is there any consequences to a police officer who does stuff? Because you could ruin a person's life, especially myself, a celebrity or somebody of that nature. It's going to be in the papers. It's all over again. I was pretty pissed that the, the, audio, uh, the fans of Atlanta booed this man without knowing the facts. Can you yeah. elaborate I mean, on that? I think people forget that in, in the justice system, luckily we do have uh, different tiers. The officer brings the case to the state, and it's ultimately the state's decision of whether to file formal charges or not. Um, you know, it, officers make mistakes. They do. Um, depending on their training and experience. And it's so important that these officers are properly trained on how to properly investigate any crime, especially a DUI. DUI is a very special type of crime. It is one that all of us can probably say we've committed. Um, So it's even that much more important that officers are properly trained on it. Not me. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only kidding on that, of course. Uh, uh, what, what, the reason I ask you that, and, and it's important to me, is because just sometimes the accusation, whether child molestation or a DUI, obviously I think a DUI, it can be worse than a felony, a minor felony, because of the consequences with insurance and, and driving and everything else. And the embarrassment. It can be Now we're going to get into that too about this case. We are going to get into this case. A little bit deeper now as a prosecutor and you've seen hundreds of cases do, do would you recommend to that department to let's retrain these people or why give those tests obviously in our eyes and everything we saw he passed those tests i mean i can't believe the man didn't even <laughs> waver one bit i can't stand up sober as a judge and and, and uh, do that yeah. now he did it now if he was impaired obviously i don't think he could do it i don't think you'd do either and yeah. if i was on a jury i'm sure i would uh, acquit mm. and i'd be the jury foreman for sure uh <laughs> but in this case how do we train the officers and what see I, I really feel for this guy and and that's why i'm doing this video because at what point are we going to start ho- holding people accountable police for for in fact, could ruin a man's career. It's got to start from the top. Training is so important. You know, officers have to be trained on how, how to handle these situations. And any good officer knows it's the totality of the circumstances, especially when it comes to DUI. Um, not just how he performs on the tests, but just his demeanor, how he's speaking, the language barrier. Um, a well-trained officer would have been able to see this, that, guy, this guy's not impaired. This guy's not impaired. Move on your way. Give him a speeding ticket if that's what you're sure. going to give him. Uh, you know, obviously that we don't have the dash cam, obviously, but and, and I can't see I can't see that man driving erratic. I mean, he could have been looking for a phone. He could have been doing a lot of things there's, in the car. There's various reasons as to why somebody's driving the way they are. 
You know, and that does not mean that somebody's impaired because they're speeding. Or even I think the officer in the beginning of the video said he was failing to maintain his, his lane. Um, that's a common phrase used by a lot of officers to be able to develop probable cause ah, or yeah. reasonable suspicion. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I get that. <laughs> Believe me, I get that. I, you know, to this day, I actually get nervous when a cop's behind me and I've been out of prison. I've, you know, been recognized on Congress and a lot of other stuff. And I'm an honorary police officer and I get mad at it oh, yeah. because I am one who believes that the, the cops should be part of the community. Now, we're going to go into another thing. When what in that video struck you? very either unprofessional or even a crime maybe by the officer is there anything in that video that really struck at you uh towards the end of the video it was quite interesting and 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 i i felt for marcel in this moment you know he's arrested for dui um now he, has his mother who's coming on scene having to see him in the back seat of his vehicle with the handcuffs on and he's got to use the restroom um and the officer certainly gets him out and has him proceed to uh relieve himself in the bushes uh, is, is that a crime <laughs> public urination is a crime so you're essentially asking this man who's been de arrested now for dui to go ahead and uh, urinate in public which is a misdemeanor <laughs> so he's under the police custody so it's the police officer's fault for doing that correct i've never seen that before uh, you uh -huh. would let's I mean, go to a bathroom. It seems like they were yeah. in a plaza there, there, of some yeah, sort. Yeah, there's plenty of b businesses around where you could have had this man relieve himself in a proper location, not in the bushes on the side of the road. Especially a professional athlete who's who's famous, if you want to call that. And and here he is relieving himself with people looking at it. They even said earlier that there's a crowd forming. Uh, now you got him peeing in the bushes. That's kind of really, it really like struck me as so unprofessional. I agree. Uh, to do that. And at, at what point now will that police officer be brought to this? Now, is it the prosecutor who's got to prosecute this? Yes. The cop has no say. Yeah, The cop will be the, ma the main witness in the case. Uh, so the cop will take the stand and he'll be the main witness uh, for observing what he observed that night and what he believed were signs of impairment of Marcel. So you as a prosecutor would interview the cop too, interview yeah. Marcel? Uh, Marcel has a right to remain silent, and he has his Fifth Amendment right. So, and I think he will because his attorney is going to tell him that. Yep, so would you? Because you deal with athletes, you tell them to <laughs> shut up. I, I would. I would have uh, told him to not say a word the moment he was pulled over. But he, he was a very polite guy, and he he really did a great job with the cop. I, I really believe that. Also, so as a prosecutor, you would interview the police officer, and did you? I mean, you know, you always hear about the prosecutors always siding with the police. Is that true? No. Yeah. No, not necessarily. Actually, I think the most effective prosecutors challenge the police. You know, um, and I had the real benefit when I was a prosecutor that I got to do all my live intake. So I got to sit down across the table from every officer, every crime that was brought before me, and do my examination of the officer right then and there. And we had a good working relationship in that way. And again, that's where the checks and balances come in. And it's really important. Um, you know, so we would challenge each other, you know, and, and I would be able to help and teach the cops here's where you got it wrong. Here's the law. You know, you, you've, you've got to do it this way next time if we're going to get this right. Is it suffice to say that I, I, I'm trying to ask you to, you don't know the whole case. You know what you saw. Obviously, as a sports attorney, you deal with athletes and you know how great shape they're in, what they can do. Obviously, as far as the doctor is concerned, it doesn't matter how old you are. You could not do that yeah. if two of your three functions are done. I mean, obviously, well, in 40 I, years, I'm not going to question him. What struck me most about what the doctor said, too, was the Romberg test. That is an option for the cops to give. They are trained to do the Romberg test. So this officer who has done these three exercises and is saying, wait a minute, this guy's passing these exercises. Let me try one more. Romberg's there for their ability to do um, so I've really found that quite interesting that the doctor brought that up. Have you seen the Romberg test done by I cops? I have. Yes, I have. Another question, you know, he refused a breathalyzer test. Now I'm told I have an attorney, obviously, and my attorney always said, Larry, if you get stopped, I don't care if you had one drink, no drinks, any, do not take a breathalyzer. Is there a reason you saw the breathalyzer test that the cop was bringing out? Mm -hmm. Have you seen zeros be arrested? I have, sure, because there's other reasons why somebody can be arrested for impairment, um, not just you know DUI under the influence of alcohol, but for drugs or for other reasons. So if the cop is recognizing that somebody's impaired, it doesn't necessarily mean under the influence of alcohol. 
Um, so the breathalyzer only determines alcohol, your breath alcohol content. Is that test that he was getting a, a good test? No. So I never like seeing those um, portable breathalyzer tests is what they call them, which he pulled it. You see in the video, he pulls it out of his car. It's a portable breath test. I have one right here in the office. Oh, do you? Should, I ask, should we test you? You know, it, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I do have one here. And if people come to my office <laughs> and this studio and are impaired, I won't let them drive. I'll make them take an Uber. So the, the biggest thing when administering breathalyzer tests, um, and that prosecutors always have to be concerned over, is that breathalyzer, the instrument, calibrated? Um, so at the police station, there's the legit breathalyzer test, and it's been calibrated. There's very strict, stringent, strict criteria. Um, they even have people that come in and calibrate it. I think it's monthly. Um, those portable, portable breathalyzer tests are not calibrated. They're you know, not we, trustworthy. we do know that because in this place, we actually had another person come in here and he had a breathalyzer test, my nephew, and he has one in his car. He's the one who, I wanted to buy one. And we had two different readings. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were both drinking and we wanted to see what they were. Yeah. And we had both two different readings. It's not reliable. I mean, from each one. And so it was kind of not reliable. It, oh, it, they're not reliable in court either. Do you recommend to your uh, sports clients to not take a, a breathalyzer test? I would recommend not to. Right. Oh, so you, mm -hmm. you also mm -hmm. believe that he did the right thing. Well, it's difficult because, again, even the breathalyzer tests that are at the police station, we have always have concerns over whether they're calibrated or not. So the reliability of them is in question. And oftentimes, like you said, when somebody's blowing triple zeros or they blow over a .08, um, is it reliable? So it, it, it puts people in a really tough situation. Um, you know, and the law in Florida is if you refuse breath, you're going to give up your license for a year. And that's, that's a gamble that people have to play. And I have a question for you with that. That's a very important question to me. If the prosecutor drops this case, which I hope they do on, on, just for justice, I really do. Does he still lose his license? Yes. How can we correct this? This is a wrong done to a citizen. And I look at this a little bit different than maybe a prosecutor or obviously you're a sports attorney. So, you know, you, you talk to your athletes a lot here. A person didn't do anything wrong. He was polite. He did everything right. He just refused. He listens to his attorney and he's going to lose his license for a year. Yeah. You know, the flip side of it is Larry driving under the influence is a very serious offense. And a lot we of, all and, agree and, with and, that. And a lot of people die because being hit by drunk drivers. So we can't minimize the law in that way. And that's why the law has developed how it has. Um, it is a very dangerous offense. And it's one that a lot of people in society commit. Um, so that's why the implied consent law was really developed to, to protect society. So it's really a tough judgment call to tell our legislatures, well, we're not going to have consequence people so it, it, it's, it's a tough line. It really is. I understand. And, and everybody who knows me here, I, I always tell people make good choices on every show I do. That's one of my biggest things. Make good choices, everybody. Please, we don't want to see you go to prison uh, or, or hurt somebody, obviously. You know, that's even worse. You got to live with that for the rest of your life. But there has to be some checks and balances on a police officer who does that. And now this man loses his license for not, maybe if the case is dropped, like you're a prosecutor, you say, wait a minute. You're whacked out, man. You're a cop. You had a bad day. You're just an asshole. And you arrest this guy. And, and he says, no, I'm not blowing. And all of a sudden, he loses his license. There, there are. And let me just back up a little bit. It's really a, it's the DMV that makes that decision whether someone to lose their license or not. Um, so if you have a good attorney, the attorney will go before a DMV hearing and hopefully be able to get your license back for you. So there are some other loopholes that can ha hopefully happen. So there are some areas in the law that can help you. Do you handle YouTubers as well? Because <laughs> I, 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 might, I might need an attorney. Uh, <laughs> you have my number. I do have your number and I might need an attorney someday. <laughs> and obviously I know you handle athletes. Yeah. Uh, all athletes? Do you all athletes. I was an athlete growing up my entire life. Every single sport. I grew up under the boxing ring. Um, I played basketball, ran track. I heard, I read in your bio that you are a Heisman Trophy winner for the for the Brevard, uh, Brevard, Brevard County. Brevard County for high school, yep. Which sure. is not a small test. There's 550,000 people here, and you were a Heisman Trophy. That means the best athlete in the county. Yeah. Pretty impressive. I mean, uh, I guess you're not going to, I guess you can go one-on-one -on -one with these uh, basketball players, <laughs> yeah, man. we could try. Ah, yeah, I love try. it. <laughs> so uh, one more question before I let you go. What do you recommend he do now? What would you say to him if he was your client? Keep, keep being the good guy that you are, you know, and just keep on 
try to stay focused in your career. It doesn't end here. Just because you were arrested for a DUI, your life isn't ruined. Yes, it is a small blip, but he's got such a bright future. He's had such a great career. Try to just focus on that. Focus on his family. Um, He'll be just fine. You know, it's funny because I talk about that as well, getting out of prison at 46 years old and starting over. Uh, it's not over. Uh, and we know that. But I just hate to see a man from another country come here and be, I guess, treated that way. Again, you and the doc, two very accomplished people in your fields, are saying that this man was not impaired. Again, I, I want to thank you, uh, Miss Moyer, for coming on board and, and giving your thing. Would you, is there anybody you'd like to talk to? Is there anything you'd like to say to some of the athletes out there uh, or people that you know, are running into situations like this? Because we don't get advice like this too often. It's tough. You know, you just you got to remain polite. Um, you know, just remember that officers are people too. It's an intimidating situation for them as well to pull over a famous athlete. Um, and they may have some other, don't let them off the hook here. You know, they, they, you know, who's intimidated when you get pulled over. It, it is the person being pulled over, but you've got to recognize, um, officers got a tough job too. Um, and, and staying, staying polite like Marcel did really goes a long way, you know, and, and any jury, which I hope it would never get there for him is going to recognize that. Um, so I think that's always the best thing for any athlete. Stay polite. If the officer's got a predisposition and you're just going to be arrested no matter what, unfortunately, you're just going to have to accept it in that moment. Hire yourself a good attorney, and we'll take care of it for your you. Number, yeah, I'll have your number in <laughs> yeah, I'll have your number in this video and your contact if that's okay. Also, I, I agree with what you said. I just it, it, it really hurts me because I don't care how the person acted. Let's say he was an asshole. He wasn't, but let's say he was an asshole. He's still not drunk. And being... And, being a, an asshole doesn't mean you're guilty. Exactly. I talk about that all the time. Even people in prison who did bad things, they, don't, they should be treated right. It's called the Eighth Amendment, Cruel and Unusual Punishment, which you know about. Uh, I, I want to thank you again, Ms. Moyer, for coming on and giving a prosecutor's view and, and a sports attorney's view. Former prosecutor. Former prosecutor, obviously, and a, a sports attorney now. And a uh, very accomplished attorney. Uh, we wish you luck in your Th career, too. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for having uh, have me. Have a great day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it right here. You heard it from a 40-year doctor, ENT, board certified uh, in ENT surgery, in plastics, and a medical marijuana cert, uh, expert. Uh, obviously, in the state of Florida, he's one of the biggest medical marijuana doctors here. And you heard it from a former prosecutor who has prosecuted hundreds, hundreds of DUI cases and seen videos just like this. And maybe something should be done, and I'm going to say this about him pissing in the street. It was kind of like pretty low-life stuff. And, and I know he had to pee, but take him somewhere, you know. I think they could have did that. But I want to wish Marcel a lot of luck. I, I, it's not over. Contact the right people. I'm sure he has. And, and move on with your career. And if you're out there, you're an athlete, or you're somebody who's, you know, on, on the fence about stuff, call Miss Moyer. I'm sure she can have answers for you in a lot of things. But with that said, everybody, I want everybody to make good choices. Don't drink and drive. Don't party and drive. You know I'm a supporter of all of that. But you do it in a responsible way, and you do it in a, in a place that you're safe. With that said, have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe, and I'll be back here Tuesday with another great video. Take care, everybody.